that's something I love still to play around with is there's so many different ways to say the same thing. And that's also true musically, whether you're writing or whether you're improvising or just performing. And I, I love exploring the nuance of music and of language. And theory is what gives you the tools for that because there's a C major chord, but then there's a C major situation. <laughs> you know, like there's so many, so many things involved with just a simple C major chord. Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. This week's guest is the brilliant and engaging keyboard player and composer Kate Dunton. In this wide-ranging conversation, we talked about her early days with Snarky Puppy, recording the soundtrack to A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, her love of vintage keyboards and the challenges they present, and her unique approach to teaching, which has been influenced by her mentor, John Durth. Kate has a robust following of Spotify listeners and has gained a huge following on social media like Instagram and TikTok, so I was curious to get her perspectives on connecting with her fans and dealing with necessary boundaries. Kate's new album, Keyboards, features the sounds of the 1970s, and we got into some of her influences and her personal journey to becoming a full-time performer. This episode features some of her recorded work, and she generously agreed to demonstrate as well. You can use the timestamps to navigate, and you can listen to this wherever you get your podcasts, watch the YouTube video, or read the transcript. Everything is linked to the show notes on my website, leahroseman.com, with a gallery of images of Kate's vintage keyboards as well. I'm an independent podcaster, and through this series, I hope to inspire you with these stories of the incredible breadth and depth of a life in music with my inspiring guests. This podcast needs your support to continue, and every dollar helps. The link is in the description. Kate Dunton, thanks so much for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to talking. Like a lot of people, I think I discovered you, well, I know I discovered you on Instagram, some amazing reel, and it's like, who's this amazingly cool jazz pianist? And I started following you like many, many thousands of people. But I realized when I was researching you for this episode that I actually heard you play in that beautiful movie about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood with wow. Tom Hanks. Wow, that's very cool. Well, you must have learned that after the fact, right? Because I, I... Yeah. Yeah, so that was such an exciting project. Um, it was... You know, my very first film scoring experience was with the full orchestra in this huge room, but that was a very intimate experience. It was just me, the composer, sort of a smaller studio, and we were recording direct to picture. So it wasn't a lot of the um, segments didn't have a click, and I just sort of had to watch and go with the flow, which was also very exciting and somewhat unusual. So, yeah, that was really, really a beautiful experience. And what you did then would have been very close to what the pianist would have done in the studio when they were recording the original episodes then. Yeah, I mean, certainly. Um, and I got to play the, the Celeste too. And that was also, you know, that's like kind of the classic sound from <laughs> the Mr. Yeah. Rogers. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly there is a scene, it was one of the, the final scenes where it shows him playing piano on stage and you know that all had to feel very natural very just improvised <laughs> so yeah mm -hmm. did you watch that show growing up I did I did so that was also just kind of a, one of those unusual full circle moments <laughs> another you know it's funny uh, another moment like that is do you know Rafi the composer in children's music I know. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to listen to him all the time too. And then he connected with me also on social media. And I was like, this is so wild. <laughs> I used to listen to your music as a child in the car. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm actually interviewing tomorrow uh, composers who write for Sesame Street. And it's, you know, those early memories, like you're a mom now, you know, mm -hmm. you're, that whole world of children's TV. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sesame Street is just so well done. I mean, it stands up even now. It's just incredible to watch it. Yeah. So should we start with your new album, Keyboards, which is sure. fabulous. Thank I can't you. stop listening to it. Thank you. <laughs> so it's a relatively new thing for you to have all these different keyboards, all these different sounds to yeah. play with. Yeah. And they're literally all here in, I am in the keyboard studio. So that's where we are. Um, this is also a relatively new development, just having this private space to work. It was completed only last year in August. Um, and it's sort of a standalone structure in our backyard. <laughs> uh, 
but um, it has allowed me to really kind of dive into these instruments and really get comfortable with their function, their feel, their tonalities. And, you know, I just love listening to the records from the 70s and hearing how, how all these different instruments combine and what their purpose, you know, what they're used for, the rhythmic or top line or pads or, you know, and just kind of, I love <laughs> all the different roles that they play and being able to just record everything you know, myself, I've learned how to stack everything and build these whole parts with all these different keyboards. How does that work when you record, when you perform live, though? Yeah, so great question. Um, when we went into the studio for the record, we recorded the bass track live. So we were all performing together, but then I would add overdubs. So, of course, we can't do that live. So we needed a fourth person. And we that's why we've been performing with Andrew Sinewick on guitar. So the guitar adds kind of all the extra stuff. We could have performed with another keyboardist, but I really just love the guitar and we have all worked together so much and we're all friends. So it was a perfect, perfect fit to have Andrew join on the live performances. Yeah. I was curious because you've performed as a trio for so many years and I saw your posts on social media that now you'd be performing live as a quartet. Yeah. Well, I think it's also just, um, it's a shift in, you know, I feel like this record is a very different sound than what I had been presenting before. And um, I'm really enjoying performing as a quartet. It's a very different energy. And so I'm just sort of riding this wet. Let's go. Let's see where we can go with this. So I'm on that train right now. <laughs> yeah. I was researching a little bit some of your influences for this 1970 sound uh, on the new album. And I wasn't familiar with Herbie Hancock's mm -hmm. album Thrust. So I listened to it. Awesome. And I was seeing in the notes that he has seven different keyboards he plays on that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, a, all about keyboards for sure. So these vintage keyboards, are they easy to find? They, you know, it's certainly become popular to collect these vintage instruments. I feel like that is on trend. Is I mean, it just, I feel like everyone's talking about them and they are easy to find, but not necessarily in good shape or not for, you know, they're very expensive right now. Um, I mean, even just, okay, so I, let's see, maybe this all happened for me within the last five years. So even then, some of the instruments I've purchased have doubled in price, just even within a couple of years. I mean, it is kind of crazy. Um, and then there's so few people who can repair them, restore them really well, that then there's a whole waiting list to get involved with someone who can properly bring them back to life. So again, with this sort of keyboard haven that I have, I, I really don't like to remove them from here. I mean, I used to schlep them to gigs or, you know, take them wherever I need to go. But now <laughs> no, they stay here. I'll get some something else to use on the gig or I'll use cartage or hopefully the club has something there. But they're so sensitive. Um, I finally got my hands on a D6 clavinet, which is the classic like superstition Stevie Wonder sound. And that was years and years of asking, searching, trying to find and I took it home and immediately a string broke. <laughs> so it's like, they're very sensitive. <laughs> so I'm, I mean, I've heard of the clavinet, but I didn't realize there were strings involved. Can you explain how they work? Yes, uh, I can show you. May I? Is that all right? If I Awesome. Shall we come with me? And Kate, uh, for those people listening to the podcast who can't see, um, could we maybe have, a, I could put a gallery of images associated with your episode. Sure. Mm-hmm of some of these instruments, that might be cool. Yeah, so I'll do my best to have this camera going, but here is, this is a D6 clavinet, so it has all these different pickup settings, and it's a passive instrument, so there's it does not connect to power, um, but if you open it up, oh, sorry, this is getting a little difficult to see, but maybe you can see the little strings back there? I'll have to maybe send pictures, because I don't wanna, I don't wanna move everything around. Um, but yes, it is a, it's, it's almost, it's interesting the history of the clavichord and I am no expert, sorry, clavinet, sorry, I'm no expert on this, but the reason I said clavichord is because I was leading up to the history of the clavinet. It was originally intended as a practice instrument and it, it's almost like a harpsichord because a little thing strikes a string. And um, so, you know, I, I, anyways, <laughs> but it's interesting how the Wurlitzer has become so famous and that also started as a practice instrument, just meant to be kind of an inexpensive, 
item to replace the acoustic grand piano. But very hard to find a clavinet these days. I was also looking up Richard T, another person who influenced you, and I hadn't even heard of him. Oh. And then, you know, one of his things that people might have heard is um, Simon and Garfunkel's uh, concert in Central Park mm -hmm. that he played. I think the Fender Rhodes on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just curious, did you listen to these al um, these records like when you were younger or is that also more recent, these influences? Um, well, you know, it's interesting because I think a number of these things I had heard when I was younger, but I wasn't, I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, my family wasn't really musical. I didn't really have like a musical kind of group of friends. So there wasn't like a discussion of music, which I, I know sounds kind of odd, but it, I would be interested in who was on the record, who was playing, but not, not all the time. And so if I just heard something, I wouldn't necessarily go, I got to figure out what that is and who's on it. I would just say, oh, that's cool. And now that this is my whole life, you know, now I'm learning who and kind of filling the pieces in from the past. And so Richard T is, I would say, only in the last couple of years have I become much more focused on trying to unpack his style and learn more about what he's doing. And that really came from hearing him with the band stuff and the way he plays with Steve Gadd. And they also have this sort of like instructional video where you can watch them play just to, as a duo, which is very interesting. Um, but yeah, but now you realize he's been on so many records. <laughs> Uh, this would be a good place to have some music. Okay. From the new record, um, Lunch Break was very much inspired by the Richard T. style of piano. So that would be a good track to share. The reason I called it Lunch Break is because there's like these sections that you might consider a break in terms of like a musical break, more like a breakdown almost. Um, and so it's a very riff based song, just kind of these little groovy elements just motivic little ideas. And um, there is a section where, see, this is where I could just go sit and play at the piano too <laughs> and show what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, there's a section where I'm doing this whole thing with, maybe I should just go play it. So Lunch Break was written very much in the Richard T style of piano playing and it was very much a riff based melody. And then there's another section in that song that I really took right out of the Richard T. playbook, and it's got a lot of this really cool kind of growly left-hand stuff. And also this back and forth. Like very percussive, but unique to the piano. <laughs> but don't ask me to write that down. I couldn't notate that quickly. That would take me a long time. That's a little riff in there. Here's the complete track, Lunch Break, from Kate's 2023 album, Keyboards.
have you recorded most of your albums at home or no? In- um, which is funny because we do have this professional quality recording setup. I mean, the stuff we're doing here is going on major motion pictures. I mean, it is fully set up for anything we need, but it is not set up for recording live together because we just don't have the space for that. And that's, there's just no substitute for playing in a room with other musicians, feeling the energy, sharing off each other's ideas. So that's why, and also I feel the studio is just a special place. I mean, it's a sanctum, there's magic there. And, you know, you work better when you're at home. It's like, oh, why why are the sprinklers going off? And then all of a sudden you're distracted. Like, it's just weird stuff, you know? <laughs> so you said we. So people who don't um, know you might not realize. Uh, can you talk uh, about yeah. Jake and how yeah, you met? Yeah, so since... Jake Reed is the drummer on, I think, every one of my, no, nearly every one of my albums um, and is my husband. And we met at USC. We did a doctorate together. <laughs> um. But let's see, gosh, that was back in 2009, I want to say, that we met. And we've just been, we immediately started playing together, hanging out, eventually got married. (laughs) Now we're still hanging out and playing music together. But we both have become so involved with what we do that very much we work separately and come together when we have time. But we have our separate studios at home, so we're doing various projects. But when, you know, whenever we can, we love to work together, perform together. It makes it easy for travel, certainly. And now that you have a child, it's it's completely different lifestyle mm-hmm. as a yep, musician. Yep, to say that, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it is all about logistics. That's the thing is, it it felt like things were hard before, and now it's just challenge mode um it's everything is still possible it's just there's sort of another complexity to it because now we have lucy in the mix and you know you want to spend time with her but music is also such a passion for us and if we now have to play a gig at night we need to schedule child care if we want to go out to a concert i mean you know so it's just not the same level of movement free movement that we had before but it is working out great and we love it yeah, I have children too. They're now yeah. adults, but I, I, I can relate. And my husband, I work with my husband. He's also so a musician. Know. We know, yeah. Although it was like we had the same schedule because we're orchestra musicians. Mm. So it was complicated, but at least we we're both doing the same thing mm-hmm. at the same time. But all my musician friends, I mean, it's a problem to get the right level of yeah. care and not. But you know, I think um, that's really good. I, what I am always fascinated by are couples where one person is the professional musician and the other person has a much more traditional nine to five type job because that seems such like a hard mix. Whereas if everyone has crazy schedules and that's the norm, then it's fine. It just continues to be crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It was funny when she was very young, maybe eight weeks, we finally realized we had to get a nanny. We just needed help. And the nanny comes in and says, well, what's, what schedule is she on? <laughs> I'm just like, what are you talking about? She's not on a schedule. And that's when we realized that children need schedules and now we are on Lucy's schedule. <laughs> Although, to be fair, at eight weeks, I don't think most babies are on a schedule. Well, maybe not. But but certainly, you know, the um, it has become much more regimented in the sense of like, you know, certainly on the weekdays, it's very much like nine to four is work time, more or less, you know, where it used to be kind of like much more freewheeling creativity on a schedule. In terms of your childhood, you studied classical mm-hmm. piano yep. full on. And you didn't, ha- did you have like a role model for uh, pro- life as a professional musician? Not really. Not? Um, it's interesting looking back on all of that because, you know, you don't know any different when you're in it. So um, my parents would take me out to see classical concerts. So from full orchestra to chamber music, solo, all kinds of stuff like that. So that was probably the only real role model I saw for a professional musician, aside from teaching. I had plenty of teachers who I liked and worked with. And so I remember in high school or maybe middle school, I don't know, but sometime in school, you know, I was like, oh, when I grow up, I want to be like uh, the, my music teacher. Cause that's all I really knew was what you did. I knew I really want, I loved music. I wanted to do music. Music teacher was what I knew. Um, 
but I had no idea that there were so many things in the professional world. I had no idea about composing or like film and TV music or any of that. Improv improvising was not even on the docket. Um, and certainly being a solo artist was so far fetched that I don't think I even considered that. And I wasn't writing my own music at the time. So that wasn't really a thing I was thinking about. Um, yeah, it was almost more of a, I don't know. I just, I knew I had this passion for music. I knew I wanted to get better, but I didn't have a clear direction that I was going with it. If that makes sense. You know, I was just, mm -hmm. I just loved it. And you were a Spanish major as an That's undergrad. Right. <laughs> yep. I have always been really fascinated by language, speaking other languages, you know, even just read. I mean, English too. I mean, just language in general, it's usage. And um, I, I think I intended to be a linguist or something as an undergrad. But the thing is, I, I logged more hours with the jazz band, with piano, music lessons than I did actually pursuing my major. So you could tell that there was sort of a skewed interest mm -hmm. going on. But you had a bit of a turning point when you took a course with, is it John Durth? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. John Durth is big, big influence for me. I mean, he changed, he changed everything pretty much because the relationship with him was so formative, so inspiring, so encouraging that, I mean, I still think about him every day and it, he has affected how I play, how I teach, how, who I am as a musician. I mean, I have never met a teacher like him since. I've had amazing teachers, but there's something different about John. Um, he had an improvisation workshop that was open to anyone. And, you know, I really wish I was more clear on what my thoughts were at the time, um, because it's a little bit unclear exactly when I started to improvise. I mean, I, I am always assuming that I walked into that class not knowing anything about it, but clearly I had an interest in it or I wouldn't have signed up. So I don't think I was doing any improv before that at all, but I must have known that all these jazz records that I love to listen to had improvisation going on, but I didn't have a teacher who taught me that or talked about it. I don't know. It's a little unclear. I, I do wish I like kind of knew the story, but certainly his class was, where it all really started to happen. So for people who don't know who he is, could you just say mm -hmm. a few words about him? Yeah, John Durth, he is a trumpet player. He's the head of the jazz department at UVA. He ha he's from New York, but he moved down to Charlottesville and has made a whole career for himself there. He has all these wonderful music projects. Famously, he helped Dave Matthews get his start. Um, John has played in this little club in Charlottesville called Miller's every Thursday for 25, 30 years, I don't know, forever. And Dave Matthews used to be a bartender there. So that's where that all started. <laughs> but that's kind of an amazing story. Uh, John used to play with Bruce Hornsby. And he's played with all kinds of different folks, but he has made mainly an East Coast guy. We've gotten him out a few times for a couple shows and records, but yeah. So so, so that story with Dave Matthews, so he, did he just talk to him like, I'm a musician? And like, how did that happen? Well, you know, because John was there playing every Thursday. Mm -hmm. And so Dave also, they, they had music on other nights. And so I think Dave started playing with his band or maybe he sat in with John. Um, but certainly he started as a bartender there and got to know John and realized what, you know, a master musician John is and asked for help getting the band together, getting some of the music together, getting things going. And the rest is history. <laughs> Pretty yeah. interesting. I wanted to ask Kate, is there another track from one of your older albums you'd like to use for this to point people in that direction as well? Yeah, uh, I'd love to share something from Planet Dearth because we've been talking a lot about yeah. John and that is something of a tribute album. I mean, this was very much inspired and encouraged by my, you know, just fondness for him and I just love his writing style and I wanted to do a record where he wrote a couple of pieces and I wrote pieces thinking about his style of playing. I do find that he has a very unique approach to playing the trumpet, a lot of low register stuff, very rhythmic, very driving, cool improvisational style. Um, and so probably the title track is, it, I just called it Planet Dearth. <laughs> 
Um, it kind of has a Brazilian feel to it. And we recorded that with Dane Alderson, who is the bass player for the Yellow Jackets and also lives in Charlottesville and knows John from there. So, and it has Jake Reed on drums. All right. Thanks so much. Hi, just a quick break from the episode. I'm an independent podcaster and I really do need my listeners' help. Please consider buying me a coffee. The link to my Kofi page is in the description. Every dollar helps me cover the costs of this huge project. Thanks so much. And when you were still, I think you were like a master student when you joined Snarky Puppy when they were first getting going? That's right. Yep. So I was in North Texas. And actually, interesting story is so. You know, again, I had majored in Spanish. I still wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I did not have a clear path for becoming a musician. You know, I wasn't like, I'm going to do this. I was still a little like, huh. Um, John Durth, again, very formative for me. He was one of the first people to say, look, you need to, to take this seriously. You need to go do this. And so he really encouraged me to apply for music grad school. And very fortunately, Another faculty member there named Pete Sparr, who is a bassist, 
he was a combo teacher and I got to play with him a couple times. He had gone to North Texas. And so he just recommended it as a place to look. I mean, I had, this was not on my radar. I did not know. I was like, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> it's very casual. About it. um, and when I went there to visit, I ended up meeting a couple of students. And one of those students was Michael Leake, who's the head of Snarky Puppy. And him and a drummer named Ross Peterson, who played on my first album, they, we ended up just like jamming in somebody's apartment. I was like on this Casio, like up on a couch, like it was all crooked. I mean, it was just like crazy. But I remember thinking, wow, I have never played with musicians like this. It's just the level was unreal. And I was like, I got to go to this school. <laughs> and um, I can't remember exactly when, but at some point, you know, Mike had this large project that he was working on and he just asked if I would like to start rehearsing with the band and start playing with the band. And so I, I was thrilled. And I remember the very first rehearsal, it was some insane song and just a, a meter I've never before played or since. <laughs> um, but it was just interesting, very challenging, cool music right off the bat with Mike. Yeah. So you were on the first record and you did a little touring? Yes, that's right. We did. Let's see. We got as far as, well, Atlanta, New Orleans, Oklahoma. Um, yeah, I mean, we all just piled in a big van. We had a little trailer in the back for the instruments. I think there were 10 of us. Maybe a few more. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it was a while ago. But, yep, we all just did the very, you know, rustic scene where we all just kind of, Mike would know somebody and we would sleep on their floor, you know, and we would just did what we could. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah. Something good to do in your 20s. Yeah. You were in the corporate world for a while doing music marketing, right? Yes, that's right. Yep, you've really done all your homework. <laughs> well, I, I was curious because you've developed such a strong social media following. And did that come out of that experience and that knowledge? Or was that different? I don't know. It's hard to... I certainly did not uh, approach it with like a plan in mind. But you know, I can't separate it. I mean, I, marketing has always, not always, but you know, it has, it's an interest. Branding is interesting. I mean, I just find that is, it is in a weird way, kind of like the mythology of our times. I know that's odd to say, but you know, why do we love certain brands or certain celebrities or certain, like, what is it? You know, it's not just the taste of the thing. It's not just the sound of the music. It is something bigger than that. And that's always interested me to try to figure, like kind of crack that code, you know? Um, but uh, honestly, the, the social media thing, I just took Jake's advice. Thank you, Jake. He just, you know, and he's like, I've told you this for years, but he just said, be consistent. And so I just, one day so a flip was switched and I decided I'm going to make, you know, kind of a relatively straightforward video three times a week at the same time, every time, you know, and that in a way was a blessing because there's no time to worry about it. The point was to get it done and to put it out, not for it to be some mind blowing, amazing thing. Every time it's like, there's no time for that. You just put something out. And aside from that, that was my only strategy. So that I assume was what kind of got it going. Well, on the platform, like, did you really focus on Instagram as opposed well, to let's say YouTube or something? Yeah, well, the, the other interesting thing about all of this is um, I started focusing on Instagram and occasionally on TikTok. Um, TikTok was much more rant. Like Instagram, I kind of started because they had the reels and I knew that was a popular medium. And so I just was doing reels. And that was much more of a consistent scheduled attempt, whereas TikTok was kind of like, ah, I'll do something here and there. But the first thing to go viral, per se, was on TikTok. And, you know, at first I was only getting a couple hundred views, like, whatever. And then Jake was off on a gig one night and he started texting me. He's like, you better check your TikTok account. <laughs> and sure enough, this one video had kind of gone crazy. And it, for me, crazy at that time was like 20,000 views, which was huge um, for a first start. And I was like, wow, this is, it actually is possible. Like, this actually can happen. And it was just me playing my own song on the roads, like it was, you know, not a cover, not like anything hilarious. It was just me playing keyboards. So that was very encouraging. 
And for some reason, after that took off, the Instagram numbers also started to take off. So I don't, not that they're related, but I don't know. That's just <laughs> how it all started. How do you deal with having so many fans in terms of like the, your, um, your boundaries and your time with all that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do really enjoy talking with fans and I, I love to read the comments and I try to reply to most of them and I really do enjoy receiving feedback and honestly I feel like I've been lucky because most everything has been very positive. I very rarely get anybody who has anything negative to say and if they do it's just sort of part of I just let it go. Um, and I've actually been trying to find a way to feel more of an community interaction because I feel like that's what I'm really missing is, you know, I have this, this audience and I'm so appreciative, but it feels a little one-sided, you know, a little bit of a fishbowl thing. But, um, but at the same time, yes, you mentioned there's boundaries and, you know, there's only a limited amount of time. What I do, uh, sometimes struggle with is I do get a lot of requests for teaching or for recording or, um, collaboration, you know, can you help me? And it's hard to know, I can't respond to all of those because that starts to really then take up a whole lot of time. But I do feel bad when sometimes things fall through the cracks or I can't get to everyone. But generally, if somebody is very persistent, I will get back to them. So that already kind of filters it out. Like whoever wants to really keep emailing, like, please let it, let's go. <laughs> I'll get around, you know. <laughs> One of my guests um, thanked me for my persistence because this particular person had their manager sort of block most communication. Oh, wow. But I really, I wow. really wanted to talk to them. And I tried different ways and it worked out. It was fine. Yeah. Well, I think that's great though. I mean, because in a, in a way it, it, it shows that you're very serious, you're committed, you're very interested. You know, I think um, sort of a blessing and a curse of the social media is the instant access that you have to anyone and whether they're going to receive that message, I don't know. But so it's very easy to just say, Hey, I want you to play on my project or whatever, but you know, how serious are they? <laughs> what does it mean? I don't know that kind of thing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned teaching a couple times and I'd really like to dig into that with you. Okay. One thing you said is that John Durth had such an influence on the way you teach and mm -hmm. I know you're passionate about teaching theory and I'm curious about the way you learn theory, like coming from a classical background and the way you teach it. Yeah. I mean, the classical lessons were fairly straightforward. You know what you might expect. Um, you know, all the big ones, the Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms. Um, and I remember doing theory workbooks and learning the basics, but it wasn't until working with John in undergrad where I started to kind of see big picture what theory was about, like how it really is the building blocks of music. I mean, it's interesting. I was always a very good sight reader. So I was able to play quite complicated pieces and not necessarily know what I was playing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I could tell you at any moment, yes, this is an F sharp, this is a whatever, whatever. But I, what I couldn't tell you is, oh, this is a C minor scale or certainly not I am playing like this structure of notes represents an E major chord like no I couldn't have told you that but starting to learn theory with John and specifically jazz theory and how to use it to learn how to improvise really unveiled to me the language of music you know in the same way that we learn grammar to speak we're not reinventing every sentence you know we there's a structure there's a system it's the same thing with music and so learning to improvise is just like learning a language which i think is why it's such a passion for me because i still love language um and i very much approach it that way and that's something i love still to play around with is there's so many different ways to say the same thing and that's also true musically whether you're writing or whether you're improvising or just performing. And I, I love exploring the nuance of music and of language. And theory is what gives you the tools for that because there's a C major chord, but then there's a C major situation, <laughs> you know, like there's so many, so many things involved with just a simple C major chord. Um, so with John, I started to learn, 
what a lot of teachers or you know educators will call the chord scale theory, how chords and scales work together. But this is just a, an essential component of music making and music um, analysis. But the way John would teach it was also very, very fluid, very open, very top down. And I'm so appreciative of that because he did not have these very rigid formal structures that we all needed to learn and adhere to. So for example, in his improv class, he would say, um, for example, on this section, you can play a D minor scale. But right away, he would be very clear that you don't have to start on the first, you don't have to start on a D. You know, I think a lot of times students are presented with, you have to play D and go up to D and come mm. back down. And that's the D minor scale or whatever it is. But John was like, no, 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 it's the D minor scale are these seven notes stretched over the entire spectrum. And to start approaching it like much more free and random, like play an E, play an A, play a D. Like you don't need to play it in order. It doesn't need to be a scale. That's just kind of your, your palette. And I still think that way. And I'm always surprised at how, how many times a student who comes to me has been taught in a much more rigid way that scales are these little things and it's not, it's not more, it's not a color. I, I see them more as a color. Hmm. Um, and I feel like I really got that from John, just being able to think about the expansive possibilities instead of the confining <laughs> sort of rule-based music making that is prevalent in a lot of institutions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a classical violinist and mm -hmm. I don't have, I mean, I've listened to jazz my whole life, so I know enough to know what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so just all this um the jazz harmonies with all the extra notes and all the, the substitutions you could do i'm curious could you do like a just a mini workshop for us just for like five minutes kind of showing how maybe you could reharmonize a little phrase you know what i mean sure should i that, head to the piano that would be so cool thank you okay let's see so the song that kind of went crazy was originally a song I intended to be a vocal song and I was going to call it It's the Little Things, but this I sort of just did this improvisation or over those changes and that's what went crazy to something I would have never expected. And I decided to just create its own, you know, make it its own thing and I called it This One's For You. But that is a great example of chord scale theory and how to, you know, use chords within a key center. So this song is in the key of B flat. So we're going to be using the B flat major scale throughout. So that's just the basic B flat major scale. But if we think about it more globally, then instead of thinking it from tonic to tonic, we're thinking about this <laughs> selection of notes as just available anywhere on the keyboard. This particular song starts on the four chord, which is, I think, what gives it a little bit of that wistful feel because we're not starting on the tonic, we're starting somewhere else. So I start on a four chord, but it's a major seventh. And then I play what should be a one chord, except that I am putting a different note in the bass, so I'm using an inversion. And this is the way I like to think about just sort of moving globally through the scale instead of just like, oh, we're playing the one chord, I have to play one in the bass. You don't. You can play, inver inversions are so powerful. This is just like, it changes everything when you can start using inversions. So really, I should be going... <laughs> Not very interesting. So, you know, as a very basic breakdown, it would be like four, one, two, four, one. Like that's kind of the song. But because we're doing interesting things with inversions, I am creating more of a, uh, like a direction for the music to go. So I'm just doing half step motion in the bass. I'm just creating this descending bass line. Here's a passing tone. 
and I do just a run just using the scale. So I'm not thinking about, oh, I'm playing, wow, some fancy thing. I'm just notes in the scale, B flat major scale. Except that we happen to be on a C minor chord for that instance, for a two chord. Four chord. One chord in inversion, third in the bass. So I just went back up to where I was. And all that like kind of fancy stuff is really just notes within the B flat major scale, but organized around the chord that I'm focused on, whether it's a C minor, whether it's a B flat, things like that. I don't know how far, I can just go do this all day. So I don't know how far to go with this. This is great. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Like if you were gonna do it differently, how you could? My like little personal touch on this song is that Perhaps the more traditional way to do, this is what you might call a walk down. So the song starts on the four, walks back down to the one. So that's a sound we've kind of all heard in our ears. And the theory of that would be the four chord, three chord, the two, and you would add a five chord to resolve back to the one. More or less. But, Instead of playing the three chord after the four, which would be a D minor, D minor seven, still all within the key of B flat, I made it a one chord with a D in the bass. Now this is a very subtle but very important shift to create a different mood. Here it is without it. It's not bad, there's nothing wrong with that. It still sounds fine. It's still definitely within the key, but there is something more powerful, more moving about the B flat over D because it's got more tension to it. I know there's something moving about that chord and please believe me, I was not thinking about this when I was playing this. I wasn't like, huh, what's like the most moving voicing I can do? But um, this is just the power of, I don't know, this is just the weird thing about music when you're feeling a certain way and your physical motion can respond to the emotional feeling. I don't know, it comes out, but it's got this crunchy kind of voicing going on as opposed to very subtle. I don't know, I guess that's just, um, knowing how the chords can kind of move through a key center allows you to just create pieces even with very simple chord movement. So here's just uh, an example of just another way you could play through this chord progression. I'm just going to make something up. improvisation. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Sure. People are going to love that. I hope so. <laughs> now that I got the key figured out. Oh my God. So funny. No joke. I wrote the entire transcription out because I people wanted to learn how to play exactly what that was in E flat. And it wasn't until somebody in Russia sent me an email and said, isn't this supposed to be in B flat? And I was like, oh my God, I've already sold like 500 of these. Thank you very much. <laughs> So what did you do then? Did you just release it again? Yeah, I just very quietly re-released it in the correct key. So anyone out there who has an E-flat copy, it is now special <laughs> and incorrect. <laughs> and um, those etudes you wrote during lockdown, mm -hmm. I think they're so pretty. They're so beautiful. And Thank people you. can Thank you. get the music for free on your website for those. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was just a... I feel like during the pandemic, we uh, many of us took the opportunity to do something different. And that was a style of writing I really hadn't done before. And it started because my students moved online and 
a lot of times during my lessons I would just kind of improvise an exercise for them to do and I started to realize huh these actually might be useful for anyone and then I sat down and tried to make them as complete and as compact and as beautiful as possible in a limited amount of space and so uh, it's another you know thing on my long list of things to do that I want to write more of those or have a book but mm -hmm. that was very fun to write those so in terms of teaching, I, I was curious if you had been teaching online before, because where you live, it's kind of people have to drive so far, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the pandemic was the first time I really switched to teaching online. And I still do it occasionally, but I'm just not making it a focus right now because I am trying to focus on performing and writing and composing. There is a limitation to teaching online, obviously. I'm sure you've experienced that. It's, it's interesting, like if somebody who I've never met reaches out and wants to take a lesson, I'm much more interested to connect with the person and talk to them and find out what's on their mind and almost see if I can help them in that way rather than like here's a voice saying, here's like a way, you know, because the real benefit of teaching music is being able to work with a teacher, like one-on-one -on -one, in the same room, feeling the same rhythm and air and energy and online you just can't do that um so that makes it really like i feel like the the interpersonal connection can still happen and so i really enjoy that aspect of meeting new students but the actual like let's get down to it with playing is very hard to do <laughs> in the online format were there students who started online with you that you then were able to meet in person afterwards um no i actually i don't think so because most most people who started online didn't live in town, so I haven't met them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, on your website, the, the teaching part of it is very beautifully written and very inspiring. Like you oh, have thanks. these great quotes, like one of them is, uh, music as a form of personal expression cannot be taught, it can only be learned. Yeah, I fully believe that. And that's, and that's from John Durth, and that's why also the online format is very hard, but um, so John had this great thing he would always say about jazz and he would say jazz is a problem that you have to work out. And I just love that so much because, you know, jazz has become much more popular in music schools and I think what's missing a lot of the time is that it really is a personal problem. It's a personal statement. It's a personal journey. Like it's not just about learning the most alterations, the fancy chords. It's not, yeah, it's great to know as much as you can, but if you don't have something to say, and if you aren't working on yourself as an artist and your, your own style, what are you, what's it for, you know? Um, so yeah, that's why I, it's interesting. Um, music, a, a lot of times really, <laughs> I feel like I'm, like I should be charging to be a psychologist because a lot of times with my students, I, I go in a very different place than maybe a traditional music lesson. A lot of people are surprised when they do lessons because they're like, oh, I didn't expect to be going there. But it is, it's about those deeper places with music. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And you also, this other great quote of yours uh, is that uh, there is no age at which, at which music ceases to be relevant. Yeah. Never too old. Never too... Not, I mean, it's always... it's. That's I, I feel very lucky that music is what I want to do because hopefully I will still be doing it in my 80s, maybe even in my 90s. You know, I just... It never, it never ends. There's always more to learn, to discover, to do. It's very exciting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. One of um, the discussions I had as part of the series last year was with um, a woman who's a therapeutic musician. And so we talked about all these people with dementia, you know, and how music reaches them. And there was one story, he had been a professional um, jazz saxophone player who hadn't, he'd just been in his shell for so long, mm. but they, people should listen to the episode and listen to her tell the story better, but um, Trudy Letourneau. But they put the sax in his hand, his friends had showed up to play, and then he just, mm. he's, you know, he started to play like he, it was wow. there. Wow. That's, I mean, I've heard stories like that too, and it's just mind-blowing. And it, it just shows how deep 
music is to the human psyche, to our understanding of the world, to how we communicate. I mean, to me, music is so heavy because what is it? It's vibrations. It's moving air. You know, it's like matter is energy, right? I mean, we're all, this is all everything. <laughs> and music is just a, a very particular way to express that energy. And I just find that so exciting. And do you feel it's a different experience listening live in terms of, um, you know, just the literally the sound waves, the physicality of it, you know, going to a live concert? Oh, feeling yeah, waves? absolutely. There's no substitute for live for sure. And, you know, especially in that we're so bogged down with digital everything, you know, I think that's why there's such a resurgence of interest in vinyl and all things analog. It's because the physicality of it is incredibly important. You know, like I was saying, I mean, it's physical stuff. It's moving energy, you know? I mean, I obviously there has to be some sound wave moving through your iPhone to hear the sound, you know, but it's, it's different. Um, it's different when there is a physical medium physically producing the sound and certainly what better than actual human beings on a stage, you know? I mean, and I think it's also just so incredible to witness the the group energy you know the interaction and i don't know it's, there's yeah there's no substitute for a live show <laughs> so when you and jake went back out there performing once uh concerts started up again and clubs you had at, at that point developed this big social media following so did the audiences were there did that affect you um it's you know it's very interesting because I, I realized that it's not just like a math problem. It's not like, oh, 1% will come or 10% will buy your stuff. It's not really that that clean cut. Um, clear cut? <laughs> I don't know. It's not, it's not that simple. Um, I am still very much amazed when somebody at our live show says, I found you on TikTok. I'm a fan of yours on Instagram. I mean, I'm just so delighted that this is some, a real... To, I mean, it's it's really, it works to connect with people I would not normally have connected with. But it's not, what I have not seen is all of a sudden there's like thousands of people coming to the shows, you know? I mean, it's still very much a ground level effort. I do feel that um, just, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that the social media numbers will just continue to generate momentum. But at this point, you know, I haven't explored whether if we just book a gig in some place we've never played, you know, in a new state, a new city, will people come? I don't know the answer to that. So we'll just have to try and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I find that interesting because with some social media, you know where your audience lives, right? Mm -hmm. Like your, your Spotify listeners, I think you would get a picture of that, right? Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's it's not all that clear. I mean, it's like, okay, US, and then I can't remember if it's Instagram or Spotify, but on one of them, the next level is Brazil. And on the other one, it's Japan. I mean, but it's, it's like, US is some big percentage. And then the next yeah. is like 2% live in Brazil or something, you know, but that's still the second biggest. Yeah, no, it, it, I find all this very interesting. And I was wondering if like, I've gone to, um, you know, there's a wonderful jazz musicians who live in, in my city of Ottawa. And the last show I went to, it was very young. And it was a different venue than I've heard jazz before. And like shot like as young as my children, like in their 20s. And I thought, wow, is there like a new audience for jazz that I didn't know about? Do you think there's a resurgence of interest? I do. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I mean, I, I can't be it it's really speaking for everyone out there. But certainly, um, so I just feel like jazz has become more popular in schools. It's become more just of like a normal offering. Um, and so the awareness of jazz, I think, is out there. I think it's also part of the, this. I'm sort of spitballing here, but, you know, again, how like vinyl and vintage things have kind of mm. come back in popularity. I, I think that that style of music making has come back in popularity, like awareness of instrumental music, awareness of what used to be, fringe you know um but i also just think things just are cyclical and so jazz had its heyday kind of went out and i feel like it it's back you know i i do feel like 
there's a real moment for it. I mean, there's jazz in pop music. It's there. It's very much there. Um, you know, uh, Madison Cunningham just won a Grammy, and her music is described as folk with jazz influences. You definitely hear jazz harmony, you know, odd meters stuff in her music. And I mean, I think that's amazing. Um, I recently saw a concert by a vocalist named Sophia James. Very young. The audience was all her young friends, but she was singing this hip jazz stuff. It was great. I mean, yeah, like you said, it was very cool to see, and <laughs> everyone was really into it. It's not like it seemed like everyone was fully on board. Yeah, that's great. So I listened to quite a few of your other albums, and um, this morning I was listening again to let me check the name exactly. Yeah, Mountain Sweet, right? It was your first oh, album. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the that, second album. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry. What was your first album? First album is called Real and Imagined. Okay, yeah. So th these albums, some of them have like sort of a, you know, an arc or a journey. And, and I was just curious to talk about albums versus a playlist, which I yeah, yeah I have a problem with that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, I know. I am fully with you on that one. <laughs> oh, it is very hard to let go of the album format, even though I probably should. But still haven't um the uh, the album is you know the programming of an album is essential the order of the songs the the the, the arc the feeling you know how you know whether it's a fast slow what meter it's in what key it's in and a lot of thought goes into that to present a cohesive set list you know, if you went to go see a live concert of a band, they have thought about that set list. There's a reason that you start with a certain song and end with a certain song. And you lose that in the playlist format. You just get random songs. Um, and I definitely lament the loss of that. And so that's why I'm holding tight to the album format. So, of course, anyone can put a single song on their playlist. And, you know, you have no control over that. That's great. Please listen however you'd like. But, But I am still going to continue curating what I feel are full statements, full albums with an arc that has a start, a middle, an end, takes you on a journey. I think that's, you know, I mean, it would be like watching, I guess it's like, you know, watch how everything is just streamable. You just watch your hour long episode as opposed to just like the whole movie. I don't know. Similar to that. Yeah. And I know some people, um, of the younger generation, they they won't watch a whole show, even they'll watch bits of things, their favorite bits. <laughs> it's the culture's kind of changed, but a lot of us really do appreciate full album experience. And actually, keyboards mm. is available on vinyl as well, right? Yes, yeah. The first time I released on vinyl, very very excited and proud that it worked out <laughs> that we have it. Um, I, and it's been selling well, and at shows, people are scooping them up. I mean, I think it is again. It's just like a hearkening back to the physical format and just the being able to hold something. And, you know, it feels very much when an artist like hands you a physical pro it's, it's different than like, Hey, go check out my playlist, you know, like you said. Um, but I think records are, are particularly special because we can see how the sound is produced. I mean, a, a compact disc is still a for a physical format, but it's still a little bit, What's happening? I don't, that is beyond my pay grade, you know, but on a record, you see the grooves, you put the needle on there. It's all this very physical process. Like it is physically producing those sound waves in the record and we can see it. And so there's something I think very primal about that. I mean, you know, the first sound we ever made was just like hitting stuff together, clapping our hands and the record is the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's all physical. Yeah, and I'm curious, like, because you've had um, uh, maybe millions of streams on a couple of songs, so you've actually made some money through streaming services, mm -hmm. as opposed to many mm -hmm. musicians who don't really make any money. Uh huh. So, so I had looked on Bandcamp first when I wanted to buy your albums, because I usually buy. Mm. Um, but you're, <laughs> when I looked you up on Bandcamp, people's covers of it's uh, this one's for you were there. <laughs> Yeah. Like if you look well, up Well, I literally, I know it's funny because, um, and I make no money off that and I never sanction those. So I don't know yeah. how to handle that. You know, it's very strange, but, um, I, for, for whatever reason, no good excuse. I just wasn't on Bandcamp until about two weeks ago. So that's why the numbers are off. Oh, are you now <laughs> going to be on? Okay. So you're on Bandcamp now. 
I am on Bandcamp. I have the new album on there. I do plan to put all of the albums on there because why not? Um, but I think I'll only have the new one available as a physical option. The other ones I'll just have for download, but I am going to fill it out. I hope. Awesome. Yeah. If, if I'm ever um, able to get a sponsor for this podcast, I would put Bandcamp as number one because it comes up like almost every episode because I'm a big fan. Oh, wow. People, oh. people have said it's a game changer for them because they can sell their merch. They, you know, uh, Bandcamp doesn't take a ridiculous cut. And it, I think it just makes it super accessible for so many musicians. Yeah. I think, I mean, I've had the most success just selling things right directly through my website. So the only middleman, honestly, is, well, I, I have to pay a yearly fee for the website, but, and then a credit card fee, I get, if, if people use a credit card. But otherwise, that's the the most return for me is selling direct through the website. And that works out great. Yeah. Yeah, no, I did. I did buy from you directly. But I have to say as a consumer, then for the digital version, I had to like do this whole thing, ah. right? Oh, yeah. But it, you know what I mean? Oh, right. Because you had to download individual wave tracks, right? Is that what you mean? Yes. And then I had to put it in the music thing. Uh, so that, yeah, yeah. you know what? <laughs> I think um, it's interesting, because originally, there was a space limitation for what size digital download I could offer. And, I, you know, this is a great thank you. Very good reminder, because I feel like Squarespace hopefully has upgraded. And now I should be able to offer the entire album as a wave. So I will check into that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't even mean that. I mean, just like in terms of where it goes. So if like I use Bandcamp to listen to albums, and I know what's there. But if I buy oh, something yeah, yeah. independently, which I have a few times from you and other people, then it's like, oh, where did that file go? And then you have to put it. Oh, uh, yes. You know, I understand. I understand. Yeah. yeah. Totally. But I do appreciate why most people use streaming platforms and how accessible oh, yeah. it makes music and discoverability. All that is great. I really do. But yeah. for all these musicians trying to you know, it's hard. Uh, it, reality nowadays, it's, I think. Yeah, it's very hard. Um, I mean, that's the thing is, I'm not, I'm not angry at streaming because, what I mean, it's like you said, it's easy access. It's the best way to reach the most people. Is it fair? No, <laughs> but it's what it is right now, and so here we are. So to close out, I was wondering if you could just reflect, because you did go this academic route, you got a doctorate, you were teaching at universities, and then you've, you've decided to, to pivot and really focus on writing and performing. So it might be interesting just to hear you talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, um, you know, I think it's just been a really long journey to realize that this is truly what I want to do. This is the most important work I can be doing and not feeling like I have to compromise and consider it like a bonus that I do while doing a real job kind of thing. I, I, I fought that for a long time, feeling like I needed, I don't know, that, that it was some kind of fantasy to be a, an artist. And honestly, it's, um, it's really amazing and it's very lucky that I'm able to do this, but it took a long time to fully commit to trying to do it, to, to saying, no, this is, I'm not teaching. I'm not doing this other gig. I am working on being an artist. Um, cause I still think there's kind of a stigma about like artists are these freeloaders and like, what do you really do? And you know, the classic thing like, Oh, what do you do for work? Oh, I'm an artist or I'm a musician. Oh, well, how do you make money? It's like, no, no, this is it. This is everything I am committing fully to this. Um, I still think it's misunderstood. Um, but now I don't care. <laughs> you know, I used to be concerned about what people thought, I guess. And now I am not as concerned. Um, but I think because I didn't have the musical, um, influences early on, you know, like you asked about professional mentors and Again, you know, my parents are always very supportive, but we never talked about music as a career choice. And so it wasn't on my radar. You know, I just, I learned music because I loved music. But even coming out of college, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. My teachers were like, go to grad school. I'm like, okay. Um, you know, and, and even after going to North Texas, which is an incredible jazz school and playing with the top people in the country, I took a music marketing job. I still wasn't quite convinced that I was going to do this. You know, I was playing with Snarky. They moved to New York. I didn't go. I went back home to LA because 
it's not a real gig. I got to take a real gig, you know, <laughs> like I still had this thought process in my head. Um, and I don't regret any of it. I mean, this is, everyone has a different path, but I did clearly understand that the marketing gig was not the right fit for me. And I started going out and meeting people in LA and that led me to the USC connections. I met Aron Sarfati who works at USC, drummer, percussionist. He started introducing me to other students there. I eventually started playing with some of them. They suggested that I apply for this doctoral program. That was my exit out of the marketing gig. So I took that. I only applied there, no other. It wasn't like, oh, I definitely want to get a doctorate. I was like, I definitely want to get out of this marketing job. <laughs> um, and that's where I met Jake and met all kinds of people. I worked with Alan Pasqua, uh, Russell Ferrante, Peter Erskine, Bob Mincer. I met, you know, I've recorded with them. I've learned from them. Um, and that's kind of where the seeds of like, hey, I kind of want to do this solo artist thing. And I started playing with the trio, Trio Kate. And now we've just continued on from there. But I think post pandemic, that's where things really, you know, I mean, have becoming a mother and that probably had a lot to do with refining, like what I want in life, what, you know, just kind of distilling it down to like, no, what is the most important thing to me? This, this music, trying to be an artist moving forward with this. So here we are. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much uh, for speaking with me today and, and with, for your music. Really inspiring. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed being here and I hope uh, to meet you in person sometime. <laughs> yeah, I have this fantasy of, of traveling all over the world and meeting all these great musicians I keep talking to. Maybe one day. You have day. to have a convention. We'll all go. We'll all meet yeah. somewhere <laughs> central. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thanks for following the series on your favorite podcast player and sharing your favorite episodes with your friends, all of which help find new listeners. I have lots more episodes coming in this season three with a fascinating diversity of musicians and their stories and music. Have a great week.